part three of the hygiene lecture. So there are different levels of care that we can provide when providing hygiene care. Self-care would be basically the patient's very independent and they can perform their own hygiene care. But if they need partial assistance, basically they can do most of their own bath or their shower uh, or any of their oral care, things like that, but they might just need some assistance with those harder to reach areas, that would be then considered partial care. If complete care is being performed, then that means basically the patient is physically unable to do most of those activities of daily living without any assistance. So you're going to be providing m the majority of the care for the patient. But if there's anything that they still can do physically, we need to allow them to do as much as possible. When it comes to bathing, there's a complete bath, which would be washing the patient's entire body. Then there's a partial bath, where only those parts of the body that cause more odor, maybe the axilla, the perineal area, those are the main focus of the bath. And then there's a self-help bath, where again the patient's able to bathe themselves with just a little bit of assistance from the nurse. If you're performing a tub bath, just always be very cautious about the slip and fall risk there. Rubber mats or safety strips are a good help with that. We would never leave young children or our geriatric patients or confused patients alone. We would always keep them well attended. Make sure that the tub itself is nice and clean before and then cleaned again after. And then we always need to use a safe water temperature. If you are assisting a patient with a shower, there are great equipment options available, one of those being a shower chair where the patient can sit in the chair while in the shower so they can still have that type of bathing experience, but it's, it's less physically exerting for the patient, so that's a really great option. And then a bag bath, if you're providing a bed bath for a patient, they have these non-rinsable uh, cleaning wipes that are available that can be warmed so that's a nice comfort for the patient and you use one wipe on each area of the body with these you actually don't have to dry the skin afterwards it just air dries because it's non-rinsable you also can if you don't have the pre-made wipes available then you could create your own where you just take a plastic bag and get some wet washcloths and put the non-rinsable cleaner on that you warm it for a little bit in the microwave and then that's another way of doing a bag bath. There's also an option of a sits bath that you could see used like on a postpartum floor and that's basically going to be cleaning from like the hips down so it cleans the hips, perineal area and the buttocks they're just soaked in a warm water solution or even a saline solution for maybe 20 minutes or so and it's, it's just really good for those tissues that are healing also could be used for a patient who's had any kind of surgery on the perineal area or if they've had any like a hemorrhoid surgery things like that that could be beneficial as well they also have a sits bath kit that can be placed on a toilet seat that can be used for those postpartum women to clean the perineal area after elimination activities those general considerations for bathing we always provide that privacy safety and warmth a nice safe water temperature we keep young children and our geriatric patients always well attended and always cleaning all of the bath equipment, rinsing that out afterwards and leaving it to dry so it can be used for the next time. Moving on to oral care, some good interventions and techniques that we can use. We always make sure that the patient is performing their oral care so that they're brushing their teeth every day morning and night to make sure that we're offering any equipment that they might need to assist with that and using proper technique. If there is a patient that has dentures, we want to make sure that they're performing proper denture care and if you're going to assist with that, you always want to handle those very carefully and very cautiously because they can break very easily. It's important for patients to wear their dentures if they're in the hospital, things like that, because if they are taken out and the gums, actually the gum line can be, can start to change over time 
and so then the next time that they put their dentures in it actually can make it very uncomfortable and very difficult for them to wear those so we want to make sure that they are wearing them if they're physically able to do that whenever you're performing denture care some good tips and tricks I'll, I'll tell you you do not want to use hot water while cleaning them because that can cause the molding of the dentures to start to warp so I would recommend either cool or lukewarm water. You also can line the sink with a thick towel or washcloth. That way, in case the dentures do slip out of your hands while you're cleaning them, they land on a soft surface and they're less likely to break. There are soft toothbrushes and special cleaning paste available to scrub dentures with. There are also soaking solutions and cleaning products called Effordent and polydent, just a few examples, that can be used that you can place in a denture cup with cool water and let the dentures soak in that and that can clean them as well. When dentures are not being worn, they need to be stored in a denture cup with cold water and make sure that they're labeled with the patient's sticker. And again, leaving dentures out to dry, just in a denture cup dry with no water can cause the molding on the dentures to start to warp. So we would always want to store them in a cool water solution or have the patient wearing them. If you're providing oral care for an unconscious patient, this really needs to be performed at least every two hours because the mucosa really can dry out in the mouth and also they can start having a lot of bacteria building up and growing so we want to make sure that we're cleaning their teeth and the oral mucosa every two hours. They have special equipment for that. There's toothbrushes, toothettes that have suction on them so as you're cleaning it can be suctioning out all of the secretions and it's best to place the patient in a side lying position so that way if secretions are pooling up it's in the side of the mouth and you can suction them out a lot easier. We wouldn't want those secretions to go down into their airway and be aspirated into the lungs. Be always uh, very cautious with your own safety there. Uh, you wouldn't want to have like your hands or your fingers in and around the mouth and if they just kind of instinctively uh, were to bite down that could cause some injury to you. So just be very cautious with yourself there. Along with performing oral care every two hours, we also need to be assessing the mouth and the mucosa every eight hours with a head-to-toe assessment, looking for any new sores or lesions or irritation to the skin. It's really nice if we can assist patients with shampooing their hair. A lot of times they can go, I mean, days or weeks even sometimes with, without having their hair washed and so it just it helps them to feel so much better. So that could be done either in the shower or in a tub or even over a sink if they're physically able to, to lean over in that fashion. But there's also dry shampoos or no rinse shampoos that are available for those patients who can't have soap and water done. That's a really good option as well and then just combing the hair out, kind of style, styling it a little bit, really helps them to feel a lot better. This is a neat option for those patients who are on bed rest and physically cannot get up out of bed. They have hair washing trays and so that way you can have the basin here and then you just have your pitcher of water and you have your shampoo and then you have a bucket on the floor that will collect the water and the shampoo as you rinse that out. So this is a really great option as well for patients who physically just cannot get up out of bed. If you are assisting a patient with shaving, whether that is like facial shaving or maybe you're helping a patient preoperatively, you're shaving an area of the body that's going to be, have surgery performed, just make sure that you're very careful. We don't want to cause any cuts or abrasions to the skin. If they are on an anticoagulant, medication that's going to increase that risk for bleeding, I would really recommend using an electric razor for that patient. And if the patient can physically do the shaving themselves, at least like for men for facial shaving, I would definitely let them do that. And you know, just shave what it is that they want shaved. Um, don't shave anything, uh, you know, a men's beard or things like that without permission. And when you are shaving, uh, just pull the skin taut. And it's just nice, short, downward strokes. Uh, is a safe way to perform that. 
Moving on to perineal care, this is something that a lot of patients can need assistance with because it's a difficult area of the body to reach, but of course it can be a more embarrassing area for a patient. It's just a very private area on the body. So make sure that they know that they can trust you and that you establish that good rapport with the patient and allow them to do as much of their own care as they can and then you just assist them with what they need help with. Usually part of a complete bath also can be part of a partial bath where we're just getting certain areas of the body as well. Definitely provide privacy, you're always going to wear gloves, and then we use that rule of thumb cleaning from the cleanest area on the body to the dirtiest. So the cleanest we would consider around the urethral area and then anal area would always be last uh, considered the dirtiest area. And then specific information for males and females. For males, for a circumcised male, you don't have the consideration about cleaning foreskin, um, but for a male who is uncircumcised, you'd want to clean all around the penis and then you want to retract the foreskin back so that you can clean all that skin uh, underneath the, for the foreskin. And then you're going to dry that very well and you're going to put the foreskin back how it was so that it doesn't cause any constriction and, and restrict any blood flow. And then for females, again, starting at the urethra and you work your way out. Assisting with elimination care, uh, after each and every elimination activity, uh, we can offer our assistance for patients because again, sometimes it's just a, a difficult area to really reach and clean very well. Make sure you always place a, a bedpan correctly under the patient because otherwise that could cause uh, spilling then onto the bed linens and then we would need to assist with cleaning and changing the linens. If they're going to use a bedside commode or BSC, then make sure that you teach the patient how to safely use that and uh, because sometimes it's just too physically exerting for patients to get up and go all the way to the bathroom and back to their bed or they might have actual physical restrictions or limitations that prevents them from ambulating that far so bedside commodes can be a good option for those patients as well and then you want to when they're on the bedside commode make sure that they have their call light in their hand within reach that way they can call you you're close by and they can call you when they're ready for your assistance but if this is a patient that you just don't feel comfortable leaving in the room alone they're not safe to be up by themselves then it would be appropriate to offer to the patient to stay in the room that way you're right there whenever uh, they are ready for your assistance For incontinence care, there are different types of incontinent pads and, and briefs that can be used. You always want to change these anytime that they're soiled. And how to change them, if a patient is physically able to help you with that process, then you can do that uh, just between you and the patient. But sometimes if the patient, maybe they're unconscious, a debilitated patient and they are not able to assist with maybe turning side to side then you might need two nurses so that way one person can turn and the other person can help hold the patient while changing their incontinent brief. There are different variations and, and types of incontinent uh, briefs that you can see. Some examples here, these would be examples of like a belted undergarment. We would call these an attends and these can be, they're more like a protective underwear, so they can be worn over or along with undergarments. And then these would be examples of, of a more, like a thicker, more absorbent type of undergarment. Depends uh, would be a term for those, and these would be worn in place of undergarments. Some good information on diabetic foot care. We want to always teach patients about the importance of assessing their feet daily. And as a nurse, I always am assessing as part of that head to toe assessment. But for diabetic patients, it is especially important that we are assessing their feet every day to look for any new lesions, abrasions, cuts, scrapes, anything like that, because the risk of inf infection and decrease in their wound healing is so significant. Their feet need to be washed daily, nice gentle soaps, nothing too harsh, and dry them very well. We would never want moisture left in between the toes because then that bacteria can build up and the skin can break down. So that's a, a high risk there. 
make sure that they're checking the water temperature before putting their feet in the water with diabetes. It can cause what we call neuropathy and that can impair their ability to have good sensation in the feet so they might not be able to feel if the water is too hot. And the same applies with using electric heating pads or electric blankets, hot water bottles on the feet, anything of that sort. It could cause some scalding and, and burning to the, to the feet, so we'd want to make sure that they're always using safe water temperatures. Never going barefoot is also a big teaching point for diabetic patients because they might not realize if there's something on the floor that could cause a cut or abrasion in the foot. Um, even sometimes patients have had like small pebbles or things like that that have found their way into the skin and then it causes a wound and an ulcer. So very important that they always have very comfortable footwear. They need to have good fitting socks and shoes and always wearing those, never going barefoot. And again, changing socks daily, checking the feet daily, assessing them for any kind of drainage, signs of a wound, a cut, scrape, anything like that. For providing diabetic foot care specifically, we really need to have a physician's order for that and so a podiatrist is a very appropriate uh, physician to provide those orders. I really would not you know perform a lot of extensive foot care on a patient who's having a lot of diabetic foot problems without a podiatrist order on how to do that. So be very cautious and very careful with that. It's important that their nails are kept straight and short and just filed so there's no rough edges that could catch on socks or shoes and sometimes soaking the, the nails can help as well if they've become kind of thickened and hardened. That can make it easier to trim as well. Assessing feet daily for any signs of injury or infection is a, is a key point, very big teaching point. And if any injury is noted, if you're assessing a patient and you find some new wounds, just keep it, you know, clean it and then keep it covered with a bandage and, and then notify the physician right away so they can come assess that and identify what care needs to be performed. This link here, uh, I want you guys to watch this video, a couple minutes long, talks about the importance of diabetic foot care and the impact that it can have on a patient's life. So definitely check that out. Anti-embolism stockings, these are stockings that you're going to see for patients who are high risk of developing blood clots. So this could be a patient who's on bed rest for long periods of time, maybe a post-op patient, anything like that. You could see these ordered for a patient. And of course, everyone has different size and shape to the leg, so they have to be measured and accurately fitted for each individual person. Applying them can be very challenging, so sometimes having the patient lie supine or flat on their back in the bed can be uh, helpful and assist with applying those. Uh, if they can extend the legs out straight while sitting in a chair, sometimes that can be done as well. Check them at least every eight hours. We really need to take those off every eight hours. Check the skin underneath. Make sure all the skin looks good. There's no circulation concerns there. And the stockings can be cleaned uh, every three days or so just to keep them clean on the skin. And then just other precautions for patients, again, who are high risk for blood clots or maybe they already have a blood clot. We wouldn't want to massage the legs and cause that to dislodge. So that's a safety concern. Same with nothing behind the calves of the legs. We don't want to constrict any blood flow. So we want to make sure that we're not cutting, cutting off any circulation there. And when they are applied, just make sure they're not too tight. So look at the toes. Do they have that nice pink appearance? Or do they look really tight and constricted and like the, the stockings are on too tight? And if they're fitting properly, the heel of the stocking will be on the heel of the foot and then it will extend up the leg from there. They can be knee or thigh high stockings. And you'll also hear them called TED hose, uh, T-E-D, that stands for thromboembolism deterrent hose. So um, those can, like I said, either be knee high or thigh high stockings, and they're just preventing any blood clot formation or a thrombus formation. Going to help promote blood flow return back to the heart. And we can remove those, you know, once a day whenever we're performing our uh, initial head to toe assessment in the morning. Make sure everything looks good on the skin, and then you're going to go ahead and reapply those. 
So there's another good link here on how to apply those and, and the importance of compression stockings, why people use those. Um, so this lady is uh, gives an de excellent demonstration on how to apply TED hose. So I recommend you guys uh, watching that video there as well. Another device that you can see used more so in the hospital setting that helps to prevent blood clot formation is called a sequential compression device or SCD and uh, can be used in conjunction with TED hose or just on its own but these are apparatuses that are applied onto the calves and then they're hooked up to a pump and that pump helps it, it pumps little surge of air into the the devices around the calves and it's basically squeezing the calves helps stimulate blood flow and promotes venous return to the heart and just kind of helps promote that normal pumping action of the legs there. So this is what those devices look like and you can see how they just wrap around the calves there and then they have tubes that connect to the pump apparatus. It pumps surge of air in there, squeezes the calves and then it releases that. So that's another good device to help prevent blood clot formation. As far as environmental hygiene and just good safety tips, um, make sure that the bed is always in the lowest position, the wheels are always locked. These are things that we really should be checking every time we walk into a patient's room. I really need to be honing in on that. Does the bed look like it's high up in the air? You know, when I walk in their room, uh, are, are the walking pads all nice and, and open and clutter free? There's nothing sitting on the floor that they could trip on. Are there any wet spots on the floor? That can happen pretty easily. So always be looking for that and identify that and, and address it right away if you ever do see some wet spots. Make sure that patients don't have old food or spoiled food that's left at the bedside that we always need to make sure that we are removing. Once they're done with their trays, we remove those right away so that they don't ever eat any spoiled food. Make sure that their bedside table is always cleaned off or their over the bed table is nice and clean for them. No unnecessary clutter. And make sure that their bathroom is always nice and free of clutter as well so they can safely use that as needed. So we'll look at a couple uh, pictures here of some different equipment pieces and, and things like that you could see in the hospital environment. So this is just a, a picture of a, an example of what the hospital environment can look like if you're unfamiliar with that. So you have, you know, the, the bed there, then you've got usually a sink, bathroom area, and then, you know, additional chairs for the patient to sit up in. Other equipment that you can see with the hospital bed, we'll look at some pictures of these different positions that the bed can be put in. Um, but those are just some different terms that we'll discuss. The over the bed table, you can see here in this picture, uh, that's what that is. So it can roll over top the patient uh, in the bed or even uh, that's a, a great table to use for like a procedure. If you're doing a procedure for the patient, you can set your equipment up on that table as well. There's also the bedside table that will be sitting next to the head of the bed and typically a recliner chair of some sort that will be in the room for the patient to sit up in. Other equipment that you might see, there are different specialty hospital beds that can be used to help treat or prevent pressure ulcers from forming. Here's a picture of a footboard where the patient's foot can kind of rest on that, but it's what it's doing is helping prevent foot drop where the patient loses that muscle tone of the foot and, and causes the extension there. So that's going to help keep the foot nice and flexed upward to prevent that. This is a picture of a bedside commode that we've mentioned a couple of times. So it's uh, closer to the bed, that way they don't have to travel as far in order to perform their elimination needs. A bed cradle helps keep linens off the feet and the lower extremities. This could be something that can be used for patients with real sensitive skin or if they've suffered a burn to the lower extremities or maybe they have open skin sores, there's an open wound, infected wound, things like that, They're, or they've had some kind of a traumatic injury to the lower extremity and we want to keep the, the linens off of that. So that uh, could be, those could be some different reasons why you could see a bed cradle used as well. And it just helps promote air circulation under the, the linens there to help keep the skin dry. 
Here is a trapeze, which is a hardware device on the bed frame and allows the patient to help move themselves in the bed so they can pull up on that. So they're using the upper extremities strength there to be a little bit more mobile in the bed if their lower extremities are restricted at the moment. An example of a raised toilet seat. This is particularly used for patients postoperatively after they've had a hip replacement because they need a higher seating toilet seat in order to uh, safely bend at the hip. They can't bend too far because that, that could cause them to have a hip dislocation. So this would be an example of that. And then an alternating pressure mattress. This is one of those specialty mattresses that you can see patients using to help prevent pressure ulcers from forming or if they've already had a pressure ulcer that's formed it can help um, treat that and, and preventing the you know further progression of that. And then this is a cat giving us an example of a supine lying position so they're just lying on the back and another example of that so lying flat on the back supine and then prone is just the opposite where the patient is lying face down on the abdomen. And then a Fowler's position. Uh, high Fowler's is considered having the head of the bed at a 90 degree angle. And then semi Fowler's we call having the head of the bed at 30 degrees or sometimes 30 to 45 sometimes. You'll hear people say that. So it has to be at least 30 degrees at semi Fowler's. Sometimes people say though between 30 to 45. And then you have Trendelenburg position here where the feet are angled up higher than the head. So the head is lowered down, the feet are higher up in the air. And then the opposite would be reverse Trendelenburg where the head of the bed is angled upward and the feet are angled downward. All right, so we will end the lecture here with a question that I want you to kind of ponder and think about and we will spend some time in class discussing what you felt like the most important thing you learned was uh, from either the safety lecture or the hygiene lecture or you could pick one topic from each but if you can identify what you you think is the most important thing that you can take away from this first unit uh, I want you to go ahead and, and write that down on a piece of paper and, and I will collect that from you in class. This is the end of part three of the hygiene lecture.